I love hearty food that's easy to cook but delicious to eat. So there's something about home-baked pies and steamed puds that work for me every time. Hello and welcome to Pies and Puds. Sweet or savoury, there's something for everyone on the menu today. Something like this. On today's show, I visit a Scottish country estate to find out about seasonal game. Game is a natural resource that is hunted or shot. And I bake a succulent raised game pie. What do you think of that then, Derek? It looks lovely. I meet a Yorkshireman with a passion for Indian dessert. I definitely consider myself the king of coffee. An ingredient I use to reinvent a nostalgic pud. It's very refreshing, mm. more so than an ice cream. Yeah. Top chef Glyn Pennell shows me a West Midlands classic. If I ever heard the word it just means Birmingham to me. But what's this? A Michelin starred chef getting the jitters? Do you point to which pressure I'm in at? I'm being judged. I reveal the secret to a perfect pub pastry. A good quality butter is key for my match day jumbo sausage rolls. I don't mind a sausage roll. I'll be sharing a feast of today's dishes with all my guests. Spot on. Described by the Birmingham Post as undoubtedly the finest chef to hail from Chelmsley Wood, my guest is yummy brummy Glyn Purnell. <laughs> Did you write that yourself? Yeah, my mum wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> so, how's things with you, Glyn? All right. Brilliant. I'm really excited. I haven't baked a pie for about 20 years. I've eaten a few. Right. Um, so, to come here to cook a pie for you yeah. is quite exciting. The thing for me is you're like a proper chef, aren't you? I'm just the baker. <laughs> yeah, but you're a proper baker. You see? Yeah, OK. So, actually, between us, between us both, we should come up with some stuff that's pretty special anyway. Yeah, so if I'm in trouble with the pastry, mm. then you can jump on. I've got a special little crimping technique that my pastry chef showed me. So, I'm hoping there's something different that you haven't seen. So, I'm mm. really looking forward to it. What pie are you going to bake for us? This is homage to Birmingham City. So, just thought I'd wear the colours. This is my take on a chicken balti pie. All right, mate. Kitchen's all yours, buddy. Go it's ahead. It's too hot for the scarf. Let's do it. Take your pint with you. Oh, cool. Oh, cheers, anyway. Yeah, cheers, buddy. All Good luck. I reckon everyone's got a secret pie in their closet, and I'm looking forward to Glyn's baked bolty. Pretty big pie for a half-time bite, though. OK, so we've got our flour. I'm going to add the eggs. What flour are you using? Strong or plain? It's just strong. OK. Crack them in there. I use one. I'm going to crack in eggs as well. I'm under pressure. I can feel it already. So we bring our eggs and our flour up to like a small crumb, mm -hmm. and then we just pour our, our fat and our water in, and we just keep working out until it comes nice and shiny and comes together. Why Balti? Does this remind you of something you'd want at a football match, or is this just a dish you really like and thought this would work inside a pie? For, for me, the Balti, because it was um, it was created in Birmingham, which means it's basically a really nice sort of mild curry. But well, Balti was invented in Birmingham? Yeah. Are you kidding me? No, and it's basically... It's a dish it's served in, which means translated to bucket. Yeah. yeah we're a little bit more civilised now, so we don't eat our buckets. But generally, if I ever heard the word Balti, it just means Birmingham to me. And it's sort of like home, and it's... it's yeah. So I get that relation to it. Yeah. Glyn slices up leeks for the base of his Balti sauce and sweats them in a pan over a medium heat with some butter and garlic. Do you enjoy curries? I love using spices in my cooking. Yeah. So, um, you know, I use things like ginger instead of white pepper. I use... When I, when I, when I um, cook lamb, I always, like, season it with cumin... Yeah. ..rather than, again, pepper. Yeah. Um, so I use spices a fair bit, so... It, that curry flavour is always sort of... is, is present. Mm. So we've got our leeks, our shallots, our garlic, all sweating down there. With plenty of butter, because we want to make a roux. So we're going to put our spices. We've got curry powder, which is like just a mild curry powder. Yeah. Put that in. We've got some cumin. And then we've got some uh, gram masala. A roux is a classic sauce made from flour and butter. 
and is often used as a thickening base for other sauces, like a bechamel or a veloute. Is that a traditional way of making bolts? Is it roux and then breaking it down? No, no, no. This, this for me, is I just thought to myself, oh, well, I'm trying to make it so it's broken down, it's pretty simple. I mean, a, a proper bolti, they cook it in the dish they serve it in. Pre-cooking his chicken breasts means that Glyn doesn't need to bake the pie for a long time. This means he can concentrate on getting the pastry just right and the pie won't have a soggy bottom. We're going to use the juice out of the chicken to put into the sauce once we've made it. Yeah. So we swept them down, so we've coloured it all up so it's beautifully coloured. Lovely. How spicy do you take your, uh, your curry, then? I don't want it to, to blow your head off. You know mm. what I mean? I like to be able to taste it. So this is quite mild. This isn't, um, this isn't like a vindaloo or anything too hot, because I think... I'm hard, but I ain't that hard. Do you know what I mean? Glenn adds his pre-cooked diced chicken to his chilled-down bolty mixture with some fragrant chopped coriander. You've got the sauce and then you've done the chicken. It keeps that chicken very white as well. Yeah. So you know you're going to have a piece of chicken. It's not going to be shredded and broken down as well. Yeah. Sometimes you get, you know, chicken pie, just a thick sauce. There's, yeah. The chicken's completely broken down, so that's quite, quite a nice thing. And I think we're ready. For the biggest test of my career is to roll pastry out in front of Paul Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> There's more ambition than inspectors, eh? <laughs> They're easy, mate. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah. They ain't this close either. That's the that's the problem. You don't know they're there. <laughs> Whose rolling pin's this? That's my rolling so pin. So we're now. using your rolling pin as well. Yeah. Like your live sailor. <laughs> okay. Right. So you point to which pressure I'm in now. I can see I can see I'm being judged. I don't know why Glenn's so nervous. I don't bite. Well, not often. Do you normally take this long to line up? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought to myself, what a golden opportunity to make pastry for a, for a top top pastry chef, top baker. It's through to the next round, mate. Oh, thank you. Right, so in with our, our chicken mix, as you can see, we've got a massive chunks. Lovely sort of yellow colour. Flecks of green from the coriander. Mm -hmm. Make sure it's nice and full, cos I don't like half-empty pie. Yeah, I know. I don't see the point. Adding a lid, Glyn seals his pie ready for some professional crimping. You done? <laughs> <laughs> so I have to make sure that I've got enough for the magic crimp. A chef with Glyn's pedigree and brummy flamboyance is bound to have a killer crimp. That's nice, yeah. I like that. So it's just basically tweak, puck, and then push it back into its... Obviously, a pastry chef should be able to do it. It's very good. I like it. Do you want to go? So it's inside there. Yeah. Twist. Twist. Round. Twist. Round. Twist. Oh, difficult, the last one. Just tuck it in there, around the outside. Should I'll do. Cut a hole in the top to let the steam escape and put the pie in the oven at 180 degrees for 15 minutes. Then give it an egg wash and pop it back in at 160 degrees for another 10 minutes. I can't wait to get stuck into this at full time later. I'll raise my glass to that one. Cheers. Still to come, I answer Glyn's brummy bolty with a footy feast of my own. It's a serious sausage roll, that, yeah? That's a proper sausage roll, though. I'm in Scotland on the hunt for game. And what I'm looking for is three bits of game to go inside my pie. And the king of Kulfi helps me add a cool twist to an Arctic roll. Bit of saffron in the sponge, would that work? Don't push it, Mike. <laughs> My next recipe is packed full of wild meat, and I want to use it to explore our national tradition of filling pies with seasonal game. When it comes to food, everything has its season. And with the onset of supermarkets, it's difficult to tell when one season ends and another one begins. But seasonality does not only affect fruit and veg, it also affects meat. Hopeton House is a 300-year-old Scottish stately home near Edinburgh. The lucky chap who calls this modest abode home is Lord Hopeton. Lord Hopeton, nice, nice to meet you. Good to meet you. What a fantastic-looking place. 
Thank you very much. I don't envy your electric bill, if I'm honest. <laughs> or your gardening bill. <laughs> I think it took me about half an hour to come up here. We head off on a tour of the estate. Hopeton House is set in over 6,000 acres of beautiful grounds. It's a mixture of farming and parkland, teeming with all kinds of wild game. Coming down to the bare basics, what is game? Game is uh, a natural resource that is hunted or shot. Uh, it's wild birds, often reared as well to supplement the numbers, but it's wild birds, wild beasts that are, that are hunted. And so what sort of game do you have on, on the land there? So around here we've got uh, pheasants and partridges, uh, we've got rabbits and hares, deer, largely roe deer wild on the estate, but we've also got fallow and red deer within the grounds. Woodcock coming into the woods, and we have grey partridge here, but not nearly as many as we used to. Back at the house, there are many historical treasures, but I'm particularly interested in a rather unique household collection. These are precise records written by housekeepers from the mid 1700s. They document all the ingredients sourced from the estate that went into the kitchens and onto the dinner table. Well, here are some uh, volumes from the um, Hopeton muniments and showing some of the foods that were eaten in past times. This, for example, is um, the year 1754 to 55. For example, there's a certain amount of lamb bought early in the year. Killed a lamb being the first of my lord's own. That was the first lamb that was actually... From the estate. ...killed and yes. eaten here, probably yes. eaten within, certainly within a certain period of time. Oh, but yes. Again, you've you got you spring lamb. That. Yes, yeah. very much so. But what you can see here very clearly is some of the seasonal elements. So at the moment we're in October 1895, and you can see roast partridge making its way onto the <coughs> menu for October. Yeah. By the time you then shift into November 1895, you're moving into roast pheasant, which of course has come into season at the beginning of October, but is starting to appear by November. Yeah. And as you work your way through the year and you come out the other side into something like April, then you're suddenly moving into things like pigeon. So that would have been fresh pigeon that had been fed up over the winter and was just ready. These cooks couldn't have made a pigeon pie at any old time of year. They had to use whatever game was in season. So it wasn't the recipe books that dictated the pie, it was the calendar. Nowadays, it's not so restrictive. Seasonal produce is still available. The seasons are still there if we want to follow them. Yeah. And that's one of the benefits of the farmers markets and farm shops and so on. If you want to be local and if you want to be <coughs> seasonal and if you want to be fresh, that's one of the ways of doing it. Lord Hopeton still has to manage the estate's game according to the seasons and employs Paul as his gamekeeper. Paul explains the importance of maintaining the local wildlife and habitat. You know, seven days a week, 365 days a year, you are trying to keep this place just right. So for you, it's the, it's, the, it's the breeding, it's the rearing, it's the looking after and nurturing of the birds themselves. It's not just the birds. It's, you, you can get a lot of ground cover now. You've got fantastic insect life. You've got butterflies. You've got everything. The place is alive. So you're, when, you're... You, when you can see all this, it's just it's the greatest job in the world. But what I really need to know is what's available and when. So Woody's pigeon... Uh, rabbit, hair, all year round? Hairs, don't, hairs have a season now. They've just introduced the season. Oh, they, really? they go out in my, um, sorry, end of February. They go basically the same as a, as a pheasant, and they come in 1st October. So 1st October yeah. to the end of February? Yeah, they're protected through the, pre protected through the summer, for the breeding season. Well, that's interesting, because um, my, my old thing is to look at seasonality of game, to yeah. see if it's still alive today. And yes, it is. Yeah. But because of freezers, yeah. then technically we can eat it all year round. The game laws basically were made before freezers and things like that, whereas yeah. now you can, you can eat game all, all summer long if you want. You know, so you can, that's the as thing. Long as, it, as long as it's shot in season. Yeah. All the wild meat from the estate goes to Hopeton's resident butchery. And of course, the game which butcher Derek sells changes according to the time of year. I want my game pie to reflect the current season, so I've come to taste the different meats that are at their best right now. So I see you've got some meat there. Can we try some of this? Yeah. We've got pheasant. Uh -huh. Today, it's early in the pheasant season, so the meat is very fresh. I've tried pheasant that's been hung for a couple of weeks. Right. Very different flavour. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that's, that's beautiful. This is rabbit. Rabbit, oh, that's right. 
It's got more depth depth of texture on that one. Yes. Uh -huh. It's more of a substantial meat. Mm. You know I mean? uh, the partridge? The partridge. Mm. I think the partridge is one up on the pheasant. I prefer the partridge. Do you? Yeah. I'm going to be making a hand-raised pie, and I'm using a hot water crust pastry. Yeah. And what I'm looking for is three, you know, bits of game to go inside my pie. What would you recommend first to, to go in the pie? Three well, obviously, your venison is your, your top one for a pie, basically. You can get your, your venison there as well. But you have to balance the flavour in it. So you, I would say something like the partridge and a rabbit. Just your rabbit will hold the flavour a wee bit. Mm -hmm. It's a firmer meat, whereas, as you say, the partridge is a delicate one. And I would agree with that. I think that's a terrific choice. I think the venison, you've got a nice dark meat. You've got something that's very pale in a partridge. You've got a rabbit that's somewhere in between. So actually, the three are going to look good together, as well as providing a very balanced range of flavors. So I think that's a great choice. OK. I think I've got my three pieces again. Venison, rabbit, and partridge. Spot on. Fantastic. So I'm all set to make my raised game pie and our estate butcher, Derek, has come down from Scotland to make sure I do his meat justice. Hello, Derek. Hello, Paul. Um, Lord Hopeton couldn't come with us. I take it he's a busy man. He's a very busy man, uh-huh. understand that. He's looking after that house, cleaning all those windows. Must take him forever. <laughs> it won't take away a while. Um, now, all the meat that's reared, all the animals that are on his estate, all ends up in your that's butchery. Uh -huh. That, I think, is fantastic anyway, because you've got Providence straight away, so it's only... What, Five miles, two miles down, well, not, not even that. Not even that. A game pie is much easier than it looks, and whenever you decide to make it, I suggest you choose meats with different colours and textures to keep things interesting. So if I run through what the meats are that I'm putting in my pie, I've got partridge here, That's right. uh -huh. venison, mm -hmm. rabbit, mm -hmm. and I've got belly pork here. Again, a little bit of fat to sort of bring yeah, that can, fat, because uh, most of the meat there is quite lean. lean. That's right. uh -huh. So what I'm going to do is pop all this meat into a large bowl. There's my partridge going in. It's very lean, that, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That's it's breast meat. And the venison, so that was breast of partridge. Uh -huh. I don't suppose you're going to get much else out of it, really, are you? <laughs> There's not that much on a partridge, I'm afraid, I. <laughs> and here's the rabbit. Uh -huh. You find the big difference is his, ours is wild as well, so there's, there's a big it's difference between... It's fat, livid. Fat, there's, there's, <laughs> it was livid when it was shot, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and yeah. I've got my belly pork going in. I think that little bit of addition of fat should make a it difference. It should do, uh-huh. Uh -huh. I've got some parsley, some thyme going in there as well. I've got some Madeira. Again, that little bit of sweetness, I think, could come out with the venison as well. A little bit of seasoning, some salt. I chop up some garlic and add it to my game filling. Throw that straight in, along with some mace and allspice to give it real depth of flavour. And that is the basic ingredients for the game pie. Now, the reason why we chose this meat is because it's, it's, it is of its time right now. In the estate, we have a fallow deer, which just started to be on season. Yeah. Uh, but the roe deer, they change from bucks to does, obviously, because they didn't shoot the does when it's breeding time, basically. And where does the flavour come from? Which one do you prefer? Well, to be honest with you, the, the, the bucks can be up. If it's just after the breeding season, you have to watch because you have to give them a couple of weeks to kind of recover, if you know what I mean, after the exercise of the breeding season. So <laughs> <laughs> you, you find it's slightly better after a couple of weeks, the bucks. Oh, right. Nice. And they kind of go into hiding, actually, according to the gamekeeper. They kind of go missing, they run away and hide and stock up do. on things, aye. I bet they do. Right. <laughs> Whatever meat you're putting in your pie, it's going to need a good, strong pastry, and a robust hot water crust is the answer. I use 50-50 strong and plain flour with some butter rubbed in to start. But the key is this, lard, melted in hot water. This soaks straight into the flour and makes it strong. So what I've done is added all the, the lard, the water to this mixture with the flour, and then begin to just fold it into the middle for now, begin to build up the pastry. It's still quite warm, so initially use your spoon, and then when it's warm enough to touch, then get your hand in there. And all I'm doing is folding from the outside with my knuckles into the middle. And again, it's just building up the little bit of gluten that is in the strong flour and turn it to a, a nice, smooth pastry. It's a double action, actually. The first thing you're doing is actually mixing all the ingredients in together, and the second thing is you're just building up a little bit of resistance, a little bit of gluten in there as well. 
I'm rolling out my pastry to line an 8 inch tin to make a large family size game pie, but you can make individual ones if you want. Do you know if the grease is tin or anything? No, like all the fat's in there. Uh, all the fats in there, you got lard in there, you got mm -hmm. butter in there, so it, it creates its own shine off at Wars Cross Pastry. If you think of pork pies, you wouldn't line a pork pie no, to no, it. No, no, It's the same it's thing. It's very really. similar, is it? Yeah. And pastry exactly, on it, same it? pastry. So let's look at that. If I bring my tin over, yeah, that'll go up the sides and on the top. So get your pastry, pop your tin down there, throw it over, get it inside, just take a little bit over the top of the lip so you know you, that's what you've got to work with. And again, slowly move round, pushing it down to the bottom. You need to work quickly with hot water crust pastry because the texture changes as it cools and it can become more crumbly. Make sure you don't have any cracks or holes in the pastry before you add the filling. So you wouldn't cook any of that at all or first? You would just what cook we're going to do, we're going we're gonna to cook this quite... It's a hot, it's a hot water crust pastry. Right. It'll take okay. a bit of heat for a considerable right. time. It's, it's going to take some cooking. I mean, it's nearly two hours, and ah. that will allow... Because it's quite lean meat as well. well... I was going to ask you, if you put any stock or anything in that to help no. with that? No. No. So the whole thing, that's going to produce the fat. I'm hoping the, the fat, fat from the, from the, the belly, belly will release. Right, OK. And then the lean meat will cook as well. Mm -hmm. Now, when you're looking at the meat that's, that we've chosen in there, the, the partridge, the venison, the rabbit, you know, coming into winter time, what other meats are going to become available? Well, your pheasants is the main uh, game bird shooting over that season. Uh, they'll go all the way through to the end of January. Now, what I've done is I've rolled out the lid. Once you've added the lid, you can then trim the edges and crimp. Anything left over, there, it can always turn into a pork pie. <laughs> Finally, pierce the lid and add an egg wash. And brush it well all over the top. Put it in the oven at 200 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes. Then turn the temperature down to 180 and bake for a further hour and a half. Here's one that has been baked. What do you think of that, then, Derek? It looks lovely. Now, that is a proper game pie. It has the partridge, it has the venison, has the rabbit, all the way from Lord Hopeton. So that's my pie from the Hopeton estate. But you can use the same recipe for whatever meats are best in season, whenever you fancy giving it a whirl. Talk to your butcher and experiment with your own version. Derek, you'll have to wait a little bit longer before we get a chance to eat it. Look forward to it. Earlier, Glyn Pernell took a break from the Michelin-starred food he's most famous for to show me a secret love of his, his chicken bolty pie, infused with memories of his beloved Birmingham city. <laughs> well, I've got a half-time secret from the terraces of Anfield. Well, my guilty pleasure when I'm watching the footy is a sausage roll. I don't mind a sausage roll, to be honest with you. As long as it's got... For me, it has to have plenty of meat in it. That's yeah. what I've done. Good lad. Don't you worry about me, Glyn. I make big sausage rolls packed full of flavour, and I'm quite fussy about the pastry. No surprises there. But it all starts with the filling. Basically, choose whatever sausage meat you like. Uh, I've just got a sausage meat that I like. I've got a pork sausage. I've got a little bit of thyme in there as well. If you just pop that in there with that and just rip a bit of thyme off, mix it up for us, oh, that'd yeah, be grand. Thank, that. you. Thank you. So, to move on, I'm going to use... I'm going to make a proper puff pastry. Into a bowl of 50-50 plain and strong flour, I add two eggs, salt and some water to bring it all together. Puff pastry has a reputation for being difficult, but it's not at all. You just need to know what you're doing, so listen up. Puff pastry is all about the difference between cold and hot. Mm. Now, if you can get your dough as cold as possible, as quickly as possible, uh -huh. then you'll end up with something that will, when you put it in the oven, it will just go Oof, and it'll just explode in an oven. OK. And does that make it crispier? The crispiness comes from the temperature and the butter. A good quality butter is key with a good puff pastry. Yeah. I mean, I tend to use Normandy butter, some French butter. Yeah. Slightly higher melting temperature, it means you can manipulate it more in the dough. And therefore, if you get a cheap butter, you'll tend to find that in the dough itself, 
it will just melt out the side as you're laminating it, as you're okay. beginning to fold it, and that is a bad sign. Is there normally one got more uh, oil content in it? Is that why it it's makes... the keratin levels you've got to be careful of as well. You know those bright, brightly coloured ones? Yeah. You want something a little bit toned down. Yeah. And they're the ones generally that are better to use. After a few minutes working the dough, wrap it and chill it in the fridge, preferably for two hours. I've got one which I have chilled, and I've also got some butter, and I'm going to show you what I'm going to do with that in a minute. Now, roll out your chilled pastry in a thin rectangular shape, big enough to accommodate the butter for the all-important turning process. You need to have rolled out your butter between two sheets of greaseproof paper so it's thin enough to fold inside the dough. Get your butter, pop it on your dough. Take it all the way down to the corners. And then with this bit here, that's perfect. With this bit here that's exposed a third of it, you fold over. And then this bit goes onto the top. A bit like you do with a croissant dough. OK. You need to pinch that down now and seal it in. Seal the butter in. That's a lovely cold dough. The butter's beginning to soften already. So as soon as it hits that butter, that dough, that nice cold dough, begins to solidify. That's a good thing. Once the butter is sealed in the dough, you can then roll it and fold it a second time to double the number of layers. Each fold is called a turn, and the more turns your dough has, the more flaky your pastry will be. And this is what we call a single turn. Over the top, flatten it down, then the exposed bit over the top of that. Seal it in again. That's had a single turn. So it's had the butter put in and it's had a single turn. It needs at least another four of those. In between each one, you chill it down and you chill it down to get that butter nice to being hard again. As a young apprentice in the kitchen, old pastry chef would leave a little message, you know, turn the puff. Yeah. And then you'd go, well, which way have I got to turn it? Well, you'd know, because he used to make a little, little mark That's into right. the pastry on how many times or what side to turn That's it. That's right. That's just had one turn, so one knuckle in, that'll go in the fridge. So you wrap that up, tuck it under, and then pop that in the fridge. Now, because it's had one turn, I know. So next time you go, if you forget, you've always got the turn. Now, I know this one is good to go. The turning process doesn't take long. Most of the day, your pastry will be chilling in the fridge. If you're in a professional kitchen, you'd probably see that, four turns. You'd probably have four notches sitting in it. I want to turn this one more time. You can see how yellow it's gone from the other one. Mm. And the difference being, because the layers have got so thin, the butters begin to show through the dough because it's that thin. That means it's nearly ready to use. Now, I'm going to roll this out. Nice and gently, start from the middle again. Come back down. A lot of people as well are a little bit scared of making puff pastry, but if you've got the time yeah, it's and worth, you plan it's it nice, it's, 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 it's worth doing. It is worth it. So what I need to do is roll this out as quickly as possible before it gets too warm. Now, let's look at this. You see this there? If you can see that area there, it looks like marble. In fact, it looks like marble all over the place. It's an indicator that the butter's got to such a level when it's nice and chilled, it splits with the butter, and it's a good sign of a puff pastry. Indeed, it's a good sign for any laminated dough, including a croissant and a Danish pastry. A laminated dough is a baking term for the process of alternating layers of dough and butter. So now I'm happy with that. So what I've got is my pastry ready to rock and roll. Get stuck in. Next. Take your sausage mixture and spread it out all the way along your pastry. Sausage meat all the way along. Adding pickle or caramelised onions gives my sausage roll an extra flavour dimension and a little tang that works brilliantly with the herby sausage meat and buttery pastry. And then roll it up. It's a serious sausage roll, aren't you? That's a proper sausage roll, though. I want, I want some big jumbo, so I'm going to trim off the end first, make sure it's nice and straight. Mark out where you want to cut and then slice into good-sized portions. Once cut, put the rolls on a baking tray lined with baking parchment and brush them thoroughly with a rich egg wash. Give it that rich yellow colour. Then put them back in the fridge to chill for 30 minutes. When it comes out of the fridge, you double egg wash. You egg wash the whole thing again. Then with the back of the blade, just run your knife from the top 
over to the other side. And what that does is creates a lovely pattern on top of the sausage rolls. And you do this on all of them. Then you bake it off at 200 degrees Celsius for about 15 to 20 minutes, the beautiful and golden brown. Now, the secret is with the egg wash, don't let the colour kid you. You think it's going dark, stick with it. It will flake up and it'll be absolutely beautiful. It'll be a little bit tight inside because it's constricted, but you'll end up with a gorgeous tasting puff pastry. And let me show you this. Those there are proper sausage rolls. You can see the way they're split, the way they've been cut. Beautiful colours filled with the sausage meat of your own desire. And there you have it, sausage rolls. Make your sausage rolls any size you want, but don't expect them to last very long. They go down a treat. We're going to have to wait a little bit longer to eat them, mate. Cheers. Cheers. Nice one, Paul. I grew up during the heyday of the Arctic roll, when the heady combination of raspberry sponge with vanilla ice cream felt like a luxury treat. It still does. I want to make this old favourite but reflect a bit of modern Britain by incorporating an exotic twist which I found on the streets of Leeds. Originally from India, kulfi is a frozen dessert. It's a bit like ice cream, but it's thicker, more creamy, and comes in flavours we wouldn't normally associate with puddings, like cardamom, saffron, and pistachio. Mike Tattersall started his artisan kulfi business after getting an original recipe for mango kulfi from his wife's Punjabi parents, who still get to regularly taste test and give him the thumbs up. Very nice, Michael. Thank you. It is beautiful, <laughs> absolutely delicious. It's more than I expected. That's great yeah. news. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so glad you like it. It's very nice, it tastes good, and it's very healthy. The ingredients are pure, texture and taste is always the same. Mike has done us really proud, and I'm very, very happy, and uh, wish him all the best. <laughs> Thank you. Mike still makes all his coffee in the same place he started, his own kitchen. The main difference between ice cream and kulfi is ice cream does have air mixed into it, but kulfi is a dense ice dessert with no air pumped into it. Today he's making a batch of mango flavour kulfi. I've got a mix of reduced milk and cream and I'm just about to add a mango pulp to it. There's three key ingredients, reduced milk, cream, and a little bit of sweetened condensed milk. It takes a little bit of a while to mix in the pulp. The pulp's quite uh, dense. The product's ready to go in the freezer to work its magic, I suppose. Now in its fourth year, the business is growing, and Mike's recently invested in a tuk-tuk to take his exotic indie ices on the road. Today, he's setting up Asher, that's the name of his tuk-tuk, in Handpicked Hall in Leeds to see what the locals make of his homemade kulfi. A lot of people have experienced kulfi in Indian restaurants, but um, mass-produced kulfi is not the same as artisan kulfi that I make. He sells a range of over 10 flavours. The biggest seller is almond and pistachio, closely followed by mango. Amongst his popular flavours, Mike has the 1947, inspired by India's independence, which combines three layers in one kulfi stick, almond and pistachio, cardamom and classic mango. Mmm, it's very nice, very tasty. Cardamom brings more flavour out. It's actually delicious. First two layers were nice, and, and the bottom was mango, so it was sweet, but it's nice. Mike's Wobbly Bobbly is covered in hundreds and thousands. Very nice. Delicious. Um, unique. That was yummy. Oh, I can eat more, definitely. Um. Mike has developed a passionate following for his artisan kulfi, which tastes very different from the sweet desserts served in Indian restaurants. Very nice. I like it. I like it to write a lot. 
I'd definitely try this again. If I had a choice between this and the run of the meal ice cream, I'd go for this every time. It was lovely, yeah? Oh, great. Mm. Thank you. Remind me, India. Did it? Mm. Oh, lovely. <laughs> I was getting lovely feedback today. In fact, some of the ladies were saying it was better than coffee they'd tasted on the streets of India. I definitely consider myself the king of kulfi, or should I say the Maharaja of kulfi. I want to kick a much maligned 70s dessert back into the spotlight. And what better way than with a Bollywood boost from Mike's exotic homemade kulfi. And our mobile kulfi man, Mike, is here with me. Hello, Mike. Hi, Paul. So what have we got here? We've got a wobbly bobbly and a 1947. So what's on the top there? That's almond pistachio, a bit of cardamom. Nice. OK, what's the middle bit? That's a plain cardamom. Nice. And what's the bottom bit? Mango kulfi. Nice. You have to try this. This is absolutely delicious. I mean, I find the flavours in this Creamier than an ice cream. It's got, for me, it's got more flavour than an ice cream as well, to be honest. Um, and just, I mean, it's quite clever what you've done there with the Neapolitan. Mm -hmm. I mean, you do all this at home as well. Yeah, all in my home kitchen. Yeah. But it's clever to put it into an ice cream, which actually, after a curry, that would go down a treat. Yeah. The cardamom on its own just really cuts through the fat, I find, and, and, and the flavour comes through quite strong. What are you going to do? I'm going to make a real classic now, which is Arctic Roll. Now, I remember Arctic Roll when I was oof, six, seven. It was a big treat in my house. My mum used to say, go to the freezer, go and get your, your pudding. And it was always the first thing I saw, Arctic Roll. Normally amongst, to be honest, plates full of plated pies, apple pies, but Arctic Roll was a big favourite, especially on a Sunday. I'm making a classic Swiss roll sponge mix for my Arctic Roll. What you've got to do is mix this together to ribbon stage. And I'll show you what that is. To get a ribbon consistency, whisk your mixture until you can see it holding its shape. And you can see, at the moment, it disappears almost straight away. So it needs more mixing. Straight on. Just means that I have another mouthful. <laughs> it's very refreshing, mm. more so than an ice cream. Yeah. Now this. Looks about right. Now look, it's holding more. That is fine. Now the next thing to do is fold your flour in. Now, if you get a little bit of flour in, remember to sift your flour for a super light sponge. Carry on folding until you can't see any more flour in the mixture. So get underneath it, cut through the middle, underneath and cut through the middle. Once it's nicely folded, tip your mixture into a pre-lined tin and spread it thinly with a spatula. Would this rise in the oven when you're baking it, or is it going to be... It will jump egg? slightly. No, it will jump slightly. It's because, the, because you've whisked the eggs up, that'll give you the volume that you need. You don't want a lot of rise, because at the end of the day, Arctic Roll's meant to be spread out, you know? Yeah, yeah. Spread the mixture evenly and put it into the oven at 180 degrees for around 10 minutes. I'm cracking on with the sponge I made earlier. Pop the paper onto the cotton board, get some caster sugar. All over the top. Now, this is actually going to be on the outside of the roll. And you need to tip this out straight into that. Peel off your paper carefully. And there you have your sponge. Now you need to add your jam. I mean, you can use any jam if you want to. Yeah, I was wondering about pineapple jam, actually. Well, you know what? I was just about to say the same <laughs> thing to you. I was going to say, you could use, if you've got mango, you could have a mango puree on there, you could have a pineapple, you could yeah. do whatever you want. Yeah. So if you want to replicate this, Mike, yeah, no, that's the way thinking, to do it. Yeah. Bit of saffron in the sponge, would that work? Don't push it, Mike. <laughs> We've got some beautiful raspberry jam all over that. Now, this is the tricky bit. Got some kulfi in here. 
Now, obviously, if you can't get all the coffee, you can use ice cream. I'm just trying this out to see if it works. Coffee melts quickly, so don't hang about with this bit. Lay your coffee pieces in a row and wrap them in greaseproof paper. And try and manipulate that into a sausage, OK? So once you've done that, you pop that into the freezer because it's softened up. I mean, that's softened it up already. Yeah. Fortunately, Mike, I've got one up frozen. Now, undo this very quickly. Pop that onto your sponge. For the fiddly bit, use the greaseproof paper to help you roll the sponge over the filling. Straight over. Straight down. Put a bit of pressure on there. Seal it off down the bottom. And you've got to be quick. Lift it onto there. And there is your Arctic roll. Just like I remember my mum making. Now, you find me a kid who isn't excited about an Arctic roll. And if you use coffee or posh ice cream, I think you'll win over any grown-up dinner party too. Do you like that, Mike? It looks great. I can't wait to taste it. Neither can I, but we're going to have to wait a little bit longer. Cooked up a storm today and everyone's probably famished. Yeah. Tuck in, guys. Cheers. Thank Tuck you. in. Today's tasting table is a real clash of flavour cultures. Indian balti and a creamy kulfi versus a sturdy sausage roll and a beautiful game pie. Glynn's chicken curry in a pie certainly gave me a run for my money in the football snack steaks, but I think my sausage roll was also a worthy opponent. Mm. Spot on. That's it right there. Yeah. What did you call the sausage rolls? I've called the... Jumbo sausage rolls. Jumbo sausage rolls. Never roll. heard of a jumbo sausage roll. That's how a sausage roll should taste. Yeah. Definitely delicious. <laughs> yeah. Plenty of meats. Well, do you like the sausage roll? I do. It's lovely. It's lovely. I like, as you see, the, the pickle certainly makes a different change. Okay. The beauty of my raised game pie is that you can make it using just about any meat you like. The selection of venison, rabbit and partridge take it to the top of the table. I think the, um, the game pie is delicious as well. Mm. So dense with meat, which is beautiful. It's all seasonal, seasonal meat. I think it's lovely. You like that? Mm -hmm. You're going to sell that, sell that in your farm shop, Derek? We'll give it a try. Will Lord Hopeton like enjoy this, you reckon? Well, I would hope so. <laughs> <laughs> and the addition of Mike's super creamy kulfi has really kicked my Arctic roll into the back of the net. What a result. I think the jam goes really well with it. I was just going to say that. Comfort. It really goes well with it. I think it's a blend, isn't it, between almost British culture meets Indian culture, mm -hmm. using cool feet. Definitely, probably. Definitely. First time I've seen it in Arctic Roll, and definitely I'll be doing it again. You're going to have to do that again, mate. Definitely. This is a classic modern buffet. You have a bowl seat inside a hot water crust pastry. You have an Arctic Roll with cool feet inside it. And then, obviously, a game pie, a classic British dish. This is proper grub. Join me again next time on Pies and Puts. Yeah.